Good evening, everybody. I'm Dawn Wildman. I'm the National Political Director for Patriot Coalition, and we're so glad you could join us for our weekly show, Nation on Fire. If you are joining us and you can't hear us, all you have to do is follow the directions on the screen right now to call in. You also have to call in if you've come in by computer so you can actually hear us. All the instructions are online. You can see them if you go to the little icon with the phone. It will give you the phone number and the conference access number, and that will give you the ability to hear us. And hopefully after the show, you will visit us online at patriotcoalition.com. We also have a Twitter account uh, at twitter.com slash patcoalition. A second Twitter account, twitter.com slash patriotwatchdog. Facebook.com. You can find us at Patriot Coalition. And hopefully you will actually go visit some of the YouTube videos we have up, youtube.com slash the Patriot Coalition. Plenty of information there at all of those places. Last week, we discussed the Parental Rights Amendment, HJR 50 where we walked through the Parental Rights Amendment. You'll be able to access that from our website at patriotcoalition.org under archives if you want to find out more about the Parental Rights Amendment. If you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, if you are a concerned citizen, you should check it out. Tonight we're going to talk about Article 5 salesmen in North Carolina. So this is happening in our national director, Jeff Lewis's backyard right now. And of the 30-plus states that sent legislators to round two of the Mount Vernon Assembly, North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor Forrest was the only executive branch officer to send reps. So Lieutenant Governor Forrest is doing town halls this month including tonight in Greensboro, where they just wrapped up a convention of the state's town hall where Mr. Michael Ferris uh, came to speak along with the lieutenant governor from North Carolina. And now Jeff will give us an update about what happened because he and, and plenty of other people from North Carolina were there um, so, Jeff, if you can tell us all what good stuff happened, we would love that. Thank you, Dawn, and uh, uh, thanks for everybody that's, that's coming uh, to our, our webinars. And if, if, um, <clears throat> if you're listening to this uh, live and you have questions for us, you can put them in the chat window right next to the phone icon. There's a little... Uh, conversation bubble. You click on that, and you can type questions in the in the chat window. And we will take some questions once we get through the formal part of the presentation. <coughs> and uh, yeah, we started this conversation about five minutes before showtime. And y'all were asking me for a, a quick debrief, and I told you I needed another five minutes to calm down. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've attended both of these town hall meetings in North Carolina, the first one in Hendersonville. That was two weeks ago on October 14th. And the one tonight in Greensboro. Uh, by the time I get back home, I will have traveled 1,200 miles, allegedly, to a town hall with my lieutenant governor, who had top billing in this, and Mr. Michael Ferris, who heads up the Convention of States project. 
Uh, regrettably, after 1,200 miles of driving, I have yet to be able to ask the lieutenant governor a substantive question. I spoke to uh, his chief of staff tonight afterwards, as I did in Hendersonville. Now, my, primarily when I went to Hendersonville, it was just to capture the video. To see if, uh, what I've seen going on across the country was going to be going on here in North Carolina. And we're going to have a guest a little bit uh, from Virginia uh, who's going to share some of uh, her experiences dealing with the same kind of obstructionism and crowd control and message control and information control that I witnessed tonight, that I witnessed two weeks ago, that uh, our general counsel, Richard Fry, is with us tonight as well, that he's witnessed from coast to coast, uh, that is not uh, conducive uh, to the kinds of conversations that we should be having about what's wrong in our country and how to fix it. When I spoke to Mr. Uh, Weatherman, Hal Weatherman, the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff, both in Hendersonville and tonight, um, afterwards, uh, now in Hendersonville, I didn't ask any questions. But by the time you know, they they had these facilities for X amount of time, all these town halls, and they tell you, uh, you know, we need to wrap this up because we got to get the chairs back and we got to get out of here. And uh, in Hendersonville, uh, the lieutenant governor gave a very gracious introduction uh, to Mr. Ferris. And then the town hall was not with the lieutenant governor. It was all Mr. Ferris. Uh, he, he uh, I'm sure in his mind, successfully argued the pros and cons of an Article 5 convention. Uh, but his bias is so slanted in the direction of trying to trigger an Article 5 convention, you, one could argue, or hardly argue that it was a, 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 a fair or honest conversation. So when I spoke to Mr. Weatherman in Hendersonville, he said, well, you know, what questions you know, do you have for the governor? And I told him my concerns. But then I didn't go to Hendersonville to ask questions. I went there to, to, to see how this was going to unfold. And he said, well, we're doing another one in two weeks in Greensboro. Ask your questions then. Well, it's two weeks later today. I'm in Greensboro. Same scenario unfolded. Lieutenant Governor uh, did the introductions, and then he goes and sits down. And the entire time was spent um, listening to Mr. Ferris and him taking questions. And uh, eventually the lieutenant governor does come back up toward the podium and he says, yeah, two more questions. Well, uh, as I experienced in Mechanicsville, Virginia, back in the spring, I held my arm up till the blood drained from it and I had to swap arms. Um, he eventually did call on me in Mechanicsville, but he did not call on me tonight. And when the lieutenant governor came back to the, to the podium, it was what I saw in Hendersonville, which was essentially, thanks for coming. I didn't elect Mr. Ferris, but I did vote for Lieutenant Governor Forrest. And I've now traveled 1,200 miles in the past two weeks to ask my lieutenant governor some serious questions that need to be asked in public, not in private, not in an email, uh, to his chief of staff, not in a private meeting with the lieutenant governor, questions that need to be asked of our lieutenant governor in a public forum. This was not a town hall. It was an infomercial for the Convention of States project. I've not shared the video I took of at Hendersonville which Patriot Coalition has the only video that was taken there. There were, um, actually, I think uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, staff videotaped it tonight, and there were well, probably 
three or four people all told that they captured the video of uh, the uh, Convention of States infomercial in Greensboro tonight. So <clears throat> I tried to get the lieutenant governor's attention, and he did not want to call on me either. In fact, he didn't want to take any questions. So I had to be a little boisterous because I wanted the crowd to understand, people that were in the room to understand. This is a town hall with our lieutenant governor. I didn't elect Mr. Ferris. And the lieutenant governor's got some serious questions to answer about his association with Mr. Ferris that goes well beyond a brick in the wall. He's more than just another brick in the wall. And why he's going around the state promoting a nonprofit and how much taxpayer dollars are being spent on that. We handed out some documents tonight, including one, if you've not read it, <laughs> that's on, if you go to uh, patriotcoalition.org, it's on the homepage there. But let me uh, uh, steal away from the uh, PowerPoint for a moment. Uh, and uh, show people this, just where they can find it. You you would think that the Internet would be a little faster than it was at the gas station two weeks ago. In uh, Shelby. And do not let me forget to talk about this one. But if you go to PatriotCoalition.org, this is our new our new website. Uh, the dot com site is still up for another week or so. But uh, in the, as we move forward, you can go to find Patriot Coalition by going to PatriotCoalition.com or dot org. But we handed out this uh, hard copies of this amendment, and I gave or this article rather on HJR 50, the Parental Privileges Amendment. If you missed last week's show, please go to, um, <clears throat> as Don told you, go to our archives here at PetroCoalition.org. And if you scroll down, you will find our Nation on Fire uh, webinar playlist from YouTube embedded in the archive. And last week's show being the most recent show that we updated, should be on the top of the list, but uh, if you click on the, the, the playlist, you'll see the first one in the list is Parental Rights Amendment. Please watch last week's show. It's about an hour and 12 minutes long. Uh, you will learn uh, in there everything you need to know why the Parental Rights Amendment is not a Parental Rights Amendment at all, but is in actuality a Parental Pri Privileges Amendment. Now, I didn't have the I didn't have that article with me when I uh, <clears throat> spoke to the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff two weeks ago, but I did put a hard copy of this article um, in his Chief of Staff's hands tonight, along with this article: "In the Midst of Wolves," the Indianapolis Article Five Assembly of State Legislatures Legislators. Um, I really need to change the title of the article because this is what, it, what um, I refer to it as because it's not an assembly of state legislatures, which is what they've branded themselves. They're an ad hoc group that's no more legitimate at uh, making rules for an Article 5 convention than Patriot Coalition is. Please read those two articles if you haven't read them already. I will be following up with the lieutenant governor. Um, I had to I had to um, uh, speak over the crowd to get the lieutenant governor's attention to ask him when. Uh, this was a town hall with our lieutenant governor and Mr. Ferris. When will you hold a town hall that you will actually answer questions? 
that the that the bulk of it is with our lieutenant governor and not somebody from out of, not just out of town, out of state that that's promoting a project of a non profit organization. And he said, Well, this is the last one we're gonna do this year. We'll do some more next year. When I spoke to his chief of staff afterwards, I said, that's too late. The legislature will already be in session. The resolution, the Article 5 application, will already be heavily ingrained in the pipeline. I'm sure it will be pre-introduced. The lieutenant governor, in fact, we read the uh, In the Midst of Wolves article, it gives a, a a quick overview of what transpired at the second round of the Mount Vernon Assembly um, in Indianapolis this past June. And of the thirty plus state legislat uh, uh, thirty plus states that were represented, and they weren't formally represented um, in in any official capacity, uh, but only one state was that the lieutenant governor, somebody that, that's got a foot in both the legislature and the Senate and in the executive branch via being the lieutenant governor. North Carolina was the only only state that had an, a dual executive uh, NC Senate or Senate um, leadership send representatives to this cabal of state legislators who many of most of whom have been duped into believing that they're going to be able to actually write the rules for an Article Five convention. <laughs> Someone did ask there were some very good questions asked tonight. Um, but uh before he introduced before I get too far ahead of myself, before he introduced uh, Mr. Ferris, he introduced Mr. Jones, Burt Jones, Representative Burt Jones, who attended the Mount Vernon Assembly and the Indianapolis uh, Round Two of the Mount Vernon Assembly, where they changed their name to the Assembly of State Legislatures. Read those two articles and get up to speed. Um, <clears throat> let me get back to to this. Uh, in both Hendersonville and in Greensboro, Mr. F- and I, I know that our, our guest from Virginia has heard this story as well. Uh, Mr. Ferris gave his, his uh, very humorous um, and insightful Shakespeare analogy about the most famous scene of all of Shakespeare's works when Romeo and Juliet, the balcony scene, is for explaining that wherefore thou that art thou, Romeo, meant something different than we think it does today. That in those days, wherefore meant why, not where are you? Well, that was nice to know. If I was trying to do a term paper on Shakespeare, but he used that as a segue to talk about the Commerce Clause. And we shared this with you last week. And I want to share it with you again because it's it's worth... Um, whoops. Let's get control of my fingers here. Uh, something Justice Scalia said, the Constitution means what it says. You figure out what it was understood to mean when it was adopted. And that's the end of it. Our general counsel, Mr. Fry, and I uh, did a little research on the Commerce Clause because Mr. Ferris was was implying that he gave his same two constitutions argument um, again tonight, uh, at which uh, I bit my tongue. But he was using his Shakespeare analogy to explain why the Commerce Clause means something different today than it did when it was written. 
that in our research, whether you look in the dictionary that was written in 1755, which was one that was in existence at the time of the founding, and actually I've got the wrong slide here, um, unalienable. Oh, did we do one on commerce? Is that in here? Otherwise, I've wasted this setup. It's not in there. Well, use this as an example. <laughs> Y'all can laugh at me now. Um, I told you I was a little mad about how things went down this evening. But in the same fashion, here's my analogy, in the same fashion uh, that unalienable meant the same thing in 1755 that it meant in 1828 that it means today in 2014, commerce means the same thing as well. Now, I do have the slides, uh, but evidently they didn't make it into this particular PowerPoint. But the word commerce hasn't changed. The definition that Mr. Ferris gave for it is the same. Uh, uh, I, that's one of the few things that we actually agree on, is that commerce means trade, transport. He says we need to amend the Constitution because the meanings of the words have changed. But the meanings of unalienable, which is what our, rights, what our rights are defined as, hasn't changed. The meaning of the word commerce hasn't changed. I dare say that 95% or more of the words that they used in the Constitution mean the same thing today that they meant when they put in the paper in 1787. So to suggest that we need to amend the Constitution to bring it back to its original meaning, when its original meaning has never changed, and the words mean the same thing today that they meant then, um, is a ridiculous argument, to say the least. <laughs> When I get a chance to share the video, and it will be forthcoming, <clears throat> I skipped over on our homepage, patriotcoalition.org, uh, an article uh, titled, Americans Should Make Laws for America. Mr. Ferris said that, that phrase a couple of times tonight, and the crowd applauded. Of course Americans should make laws for America. Americans did make laws for America, including the supreme law of the land, the Constitution. But if we don't follow it, and we don't hold the people accountable that we elect to uphold it, then we're opening ourselves up for those bastardized interpretations, for those usurpations, for the encroachments of foreign interests and special interests and international law impacting our laws and our policy. When we published our, uh, <clears throat> after Mr. Ferris was on uh, David Barton's Wall Builders, we put a, a, a video together, which you can also find in our Article 5 playlist uh, at YouTube, called Article 5 Myth Builders. In that video, I quoted Mr. Ferris, and I didn't say where the quote came from, but it came from this article titled, Americans Should Make Laws for America. After we published that, that video, this article disappeared from, the, from the, their website. Apparently, they're having some web, web hosting or webmastering problems. I'm being facetious. Uh, they removed it because he said some very ridiculous things in this article back in January. And that's the most recent article you'll find at the top of the homepage at picturecoalition.org. And this is the quote that you'll also find in the Article 5 Myth Builders video. They didn't just pull the web, the web page down. You've been hearing about uh, a CBS reporter that had a, that was investigating Fast and Furious, 
and her computer was hacked. And in addition to taking files off, people were putting files on that could get her in trouble, make her into a criminal for having possession of stuff she shouldn't have. She's written a book. She's been on the news recently. I was having a conversation with our general counsel um, last week, and we were discussing this quote. If we adopt a treaty on education, for example, all educational authorities transfer from the states to Congress. Well, that's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. The Constitution doesn't even remotely suggest that that's, that's the case. Mr. Ferris claims that he believes in the Constitution. But the only part of the Constitution that he has, he's got tunnel vision, evidently, and the only part of the Constitution that he recognizes and wants to talk about with any honesty is the part that lets him change it. Because he's got some crazy amendments out there that he wants to uh, introduce. He's been trying to get the Parental Rights Amendment variations of HJR 50 through Congress, through the first method of proposing amendments to the Constitution, um, 20 years, close to 20 years, he's had the current version, almost the exact language, of HJR 50, in the past three Congresses. He was approached by Mark Meckler, co-founder of Tea Party Patriots, to launch this project, Convention of States Project. And, and from what um, sources I can't disclose have suggested, was paid a hefty sum of money to launch this project. And Mr. Ferris saw a golden opportunity. I couldn't get my uh, parental rights amendment through Congress, maybe I can get it through the other method, through an Article 5 convention. So there's there's a multitude of uh, personal, professional, and special interest um, impacting Mr. Ferris's decision uh, to go on the road as an Article 5 salesman to promote an Article 5 Convention of States. In Hendersonville, the, the, at the town hall he did two weeks ago with our Lieutenant Governor, he acknowledged that he would like to and expects to be a delegate from Virginia to this convention. He also acknowledged something that we had already been told um, also in private, uh, that he would like to be the chairman of this convention. He published an article back in, uh, actually it was um, Mark Meckler wrote an article that he published on December 31st um, in which he included a conversation that an allegedly uh, email conversation between Mr. Ferris and a named state legislator in which Mr. Ferris said, if I am a delegate to an Article 5 convention, and I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, I will propose an amendment to change the U.S. Supreme Court to a European court model. He wants to add another 41 judges to the U.S. Supreme Court. Like that will make them uphold the Constitution. He also wants to let the states pick those judges. Like that will make those judges uphold the Constitution while they're there. It doesn't matter if they're there for a week or the rest of their life. If they're not men of integrity or women of integrity and character, they have a working knowledge of the Constitution, they take an oath to it. And nobody holds them, the people that have the reins to hold them accountable won't hold them accountable, then it doesn't matter if there's nine or 900. Nothing will change. 
Mr. Ferris went out of his way uh, to impress the audience tonight uh, with his nearly 40 years of experience litigating. He's kind of like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson, who are race baiter industry uh, aficionados. Mr. Ferris has been a fear monger um, opportunist, preying on the misery and the concerns and worries of homeschooling parents. Par- parents that are homeschooling their kids because they don't feel they can get an adequate or a moral public education for their children in the public school system and have chosen to school them themselves at home. With the boogeyman that we need this parental rights amendment to protect their rights. He's made a lot of money on that. If you look at the 990 forms for parentalrights.org for the Homeschoolers Legal Defense Association, especially the HSLDA. If you're if you're uh, donating money to that uh, racket, which is what I think it, I, I think it it reminds me of a racket. It may not be a racket, but it sure smells like one. Um, they bring in millions of dollars a year. And he's not looking to solve, I was thinking about this earlier today, he's not looking to solve the problem of government intrusion on parental rights. He's looking to create a legal quagmire that will be a growth industry for lawyers as parents have to hire lawyers to protect themselves and their parental rights from intrusions by federal, state, and international governments moving forward if this parental rights amendment is adopted because it creates an authority for the government that doesn't exist now. So, as I put, uh, uh, you need to read this whole article here. If you want to know who the 80 co-sponsors are currently, and my congressman is one of them, and I've already uh, uh, sent word and information to my congressman uh, that he needs to withdraw his sponsorship of HDR 80, I mean, HDR 50. But if you want to see who's who's the current con, uh, co-sponsor as of uh, about a week ago, uh, we've got uh, the entire list at the bottom of this article. And you can click on each one of them, and it'll take you to their official member webpage. You need to read that article. <laughs> I want to show you a couple things in the other one. Let's see, it gets back there. In the actual parental privileges amendment article, because we didn't have this this ready yet. Uh, uh, Councillor Fry is putting together um, <clears throat> much to his disappointment uh, one of the uh, conservative Republican congressmen that, that he's been working with on a variety of issues. One of the one of the good guys that like my congressman that didn't vote for the indefinite detention divi- uh, provisions in the 2012 NDAA is a co-sponsor of this garbage bill or resolution rather which is an actual proposed amendment to the Constitution. <clears throat> if you, uh, we try not to make the, these articles with so many links that it, it looks like a checkerboard, but if you think this is going to go away, you know, Mr. Ferris, as I said in this article, I was, I was like a prophet tonight. Or, or a few days ago, when I when I updated this article that I actually wrote initially back in January, that he doesn't like talking about his proposed amendments to grassroots grassroots groups when he's wearing his convention of states project director hat, <laughs> which is the hat he had on tonight, the hat he had on two weeks ago. 
but he has been vigorously promoting the Pro Rights Amendment just last month in September before Congress. He's been encouraging state legislative resolutions. And do you, do you think it's just uh, he, he's gone around and talked to a few? Click on that link. They, they've got the status. of their activity of trying to get state legislators and state legislatures to pass legislation or resolutions encouraging Congress to to pass or propose the Parental Rights Amendment. So he's, he's doing a, a double whammy both, with both methods of amending the Constitution through Congress, HJR 50, and targeting the legislatures to pressure the legislatures to, uh, to, to get them in a, in a frame of mind of thinking, we really need this, and uh, you legislators need to pass a resolution supporting HJR 50. Oh, no, by the way, I'm also trying to trigger an Article 5 convention, so if they don't propose this amendment, what, when y'all go picking delegates to go to this Article 5 convention, if God forbid there is one, we're going to propose it there too, so we got we got it covered. Be afraid, be very afraid, and that's just two. Every amendment that uh, proposed amendment, I, I don't have to worry about crazy amendments coming from the socialists or the progressives. I'm I'm deeply concerned enough about the proposed amendments that the architects of this conservative push for an Article 5 convention are proposing that intrude on individual rights, intrude on parental rights, expand government authority. His proposed amendment to to, uh, amend the supremacy clause that the parental rights amendment itself flips the supremacy clause on its head and he actually acknowledged tonight that he, he wants to amend the Supremacy Clause. Well, he doesn't mention the, the Supremacy Clause in the Parental Rights Amendment. But he does talk about it in that January article that they now pull, have pulled down off their website that we republished under fair use. So you can read for yourself what the man has said about his intentions if he's capable of fooling enough of you to think that this is a solution to our problems. Lieutenant Governor Forrest claims that he's going to hold uh, some more town halls in eastern North Carolina. If we can if we can find somebody to host them, this, this, I said, talk to the. I, I'm quite certain that the Coastal Carolina Taxpayers Association, or the Eastern North Carolina Tea Party, or the Beaufort Patriot Tea Party, or Washington, would host a lieutenant governor to come talk to us about the problems in North Carolina that we elected him to address. He was one of the few people that I, I really didn't hold my nose when I pulled the lever, metaphorically, scribbled it in, it was on paper, to vote for. I knew it was still a coin toss. Was I voting for a, electing a politician or was I electing a statesman? His lackluster uh, um, opposition to Common Core and our governor's support for Common Core, and you want to need to look no further than the legislation they passed to create this commission, and another unelected government entity, to determine what parts of Common Core they were going to keep and, and get, and what parts they were going to get rid of, claiming that they voted to get rid of it, but they didn't, and the people they picked to run it support it. 
both of these gentlemen hail from Charlotte, I, I, I'm starting to, to see a Charlotte's Web building. <clears throat> well, I've been I've been rambling for a good half hour now. Um, we have a guest with us, uh, Miss Carrie Nunnally, who lives in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia. And I've been to Virginia many times this year, working with some awesome patriots, um, and including Carrie, um, <clears throat> fighting this battle in Virginia, fighting the lies and the misconceptions and the distortions of the facts. And I wanted to I asked Carrie, who came down from Virginia tonight, uh, to come with me to the Greensboro Town Hall just so she could see for herself if um, what well, she's experienced firsthand again and again and again all year long in Virginia is what she would see here in North Carolina, what Councilor Fry and I have seen across the country. Uh, Carrie, you could uh, I'm unmute on. yourself. Uh, I, do you want me to start talking about my observations, or uh, yes, ma'am. I, I, I have one little item that uh, we've been having fun threatening to do, but we've never done it. And not counting the repeats on each separate uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were 25. I did this. I did that. From his presentation, we always say we're going to count how many times he met. You know builds himself up as the leader that we can trust, and it was 25 separate mentions, including aligning himself with Mike Lee, Senator Mike Lee, which is something I'm certainly going to look up. Um, but it was just like Mechanicsville, where uh, you can, if you haven't seen it posted already, you can see it on the Patriot Watchdog channel. Uh, anybody who asked a question that he didn't like, he jumped all over them. And he said, now you be quiet or you sit down or it's my turn. And then just starts running out the clock with non-germane information. He should just drop JBS and Schlafly from his whole presentation because he always gets somebody who stands up and says, uh, you're actually wrong. Uh, you know, they're not evil and they're not enemies of the Constitution. He, he's insulted those two very influential groups, Eagle Forum being Schlafly, at almost every presentation that he makes. And he puts out a paper telling people that JBS is wrong about this, but that he's friends with them and he's friends with Phyllis Schlafly. So he should just drop that because it's not successful. And he should also drop the Romeo and Juliet type stuff because Frankly, I read that in the seventh grade, and I already knew where, for, and why, and it was boring, and it went on for way too long. And, the, and his clap lines, like Americans should be making laws for Americans, oh, well, you know, why not, why not, um, Jeff's going out for a cigarette. Can you believe he's still smoking? Uh, why not just, you know, oppose the, diametrically oppose the use of, of orphans as yardage markers. <laughs> um, you know, he, he uses tired old lines like the definition of insanity and, uh, you know, we don't need any more talk, we need action. And he, he establishes his great reverence for the framers. It, I've, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but I made a little thing that I called Cosmo, uh, the Convention of States MO, Modus Operandi, which is, I think it's maybe seven or eight steps. Uh, and he always does this. It's the same format every time. First of all, he points out to somebody so that they know not to call on us if they're, if there's an MC of some sort. Um, but he was calling on people himself tonight, so there was no way he was going to call on me or Jeff. Um, <clears throat> But they say they ask the MC to say there's a there can be a fringe element at some of these things, and of course the lieutenant governor said, "Now I want everybody to be civil tonight." And I think 
where else do you say that? Maybe in kindergarten? But um, the second thing is to, okay, let's see, I timed it this time. From 617 to 622 was the bio of Mike Ferris, which was remarkably short, but, but not considering that later he mentions himself 25 times. At 622, he starts on the ills of government, and he finally stopped at, uh, well, you know, it goes on for a half an hour. I don't remember where I, I don't see where I put the end of it. But they, they, they do the, what they accuse our side of doing. They do the fear-mongering thing. Government is so bad, and here's a list and a litany. And then they say that, the COS is the only solution, and here's how we're going to do it, and here's how easy it is, and we really need help. And then they say it's going to take until 2017. And he also says this is a brand new thing when we all know that Meckler started it right after that 2010 con, 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 or whatever it was called. Um, sorry about my voice. Uh, he... He again says one state, one vote. I didn't get a chance to ask him about the the Congressional Research Service report, which is pretty definitive stuff. He he. You you wouldn't even have to ask him about that. Um, You could have just brought up, well, your Article 5 guru, Rob Nadelson, has acknowledged in the ALEC Article 5 handbook and in several white papers he's written that once the convention is called, they can change that one state, one vote, and apportion it however they want. And well, the CRS yeah, and, report also points that out. And I always want to say, how about making these assemblies of state legislators useful by saying, okay, this one state, one vote thing, let's go ahead and do it. Let's all of us use, let's all of us red states, ha ha, utilize the Tenth Amendment and say, we're not going to follow NDAA. We're not going to use the Patriot Act. Our people have due process here. We're, we're not like, you know, the, the communist state that's being built. I want to say that I, Jeff came out mad because Sirius is just, he, he, he lies. He just is so, I, I always want to give him a way out by saying uh, he's really, getting people to read the Constitution and to understand the content and the intent. But but I, I, I don't have faith anymore that he's doing this for better government. I, and I, I certainly have I, PRA, I, I really, don't think. I wasn't mad with Mr. Ferris. I recognize him as a snake oil salesman, a carpet You were driver. mad at the lieutenant the, governor? Well, anyway, I didn't finish my COS, my Cosmo. I'll I'll send that to you, Jeff, and you can send it to people. Um, well, I probably have everybody's email address, but Richard never answers me. But I want to say <laughs> that the overwhelming number of people in that audience were not falling for it. They were not going yep. for it. And every single time somebody asked a question... Uh, that that made him mad, or or that you know he wanted to uh, quell the the uh, any audience shifting away from him. There were, there were plenty of people clapping for his his lines, but every time somebody asked a question that he didn't like, he went into a diatribe that lasted for so long that you lost. I I, I couldn't even listen to most of it. And that's just he would, he exactly would, he, what he does when he answers other questions. It, it's not He was filibuster. He was yeah, filibuster. he was running at the clock. So, so and that couldn't have been that, more than 10 questions. He filibustered so long that by the time he got done talking, you forgot what the question was. And also... And he had drifted so far away from the subject matter of the question. And uh, also and, that makes for a great... Uh, talk afterwards with people because I I changed somebody's mind tonight. I'm positive. Um, she said, "Well, what are we going to do? I mean, it's we, we're in a desperate situation." And I said, "Well, we sure shouldn't take poison, you know, to cure the problem that we have. We we should." And I told her about my idea of the one state, one vote 
Tenth Amendment, but also I said, don't you think it's funny that he shut down all the questions, that he just, you know, babbled on and on? He didn't ever really answer them. I mean, if you were really paying attention, he never answered any of those questions. You know, if you say, I'm scared about this, he doesn't say, well, of course, it's kind of scary to think about it, but here are the safeguards that we, you know, which those would be lies too, but he, he, I said, he doesn't let us speak in Virginia um, if he can help it. He, he always has to change the rules in some way to his favor, and he also won't debate some people and you know if he has such a great product why wouldn't he you know be shouting it to the rooftops and talking to everybody about it and why would his followers be so gleeful and they're like gladiator audiences they love it when he attacks somebody and tells them they're wrong you know and they're rude and why do they love that he's he is so like Obama. He's a silver-tongued devil. I never well, got the Obama the Del- hypnotized it's, it's the Delphi. thing. It's Delphi. But, I, I, uh, oh, but I still don't understand why people would watch him on a YouTube and say, well, I like him. It's just like Obama. People said, oh, he's hypnotic. Oh, oh I'm sexually attracted to him. You know, I, I don't get it. Well, I think some, what they get people, out of it, though, I think what they like about him, though, is they've managed to, from from the beginning of this, when they held some phone town halls, and they did it a little bit like Frank Lutz does in the sense of finding out what are the key issues that, that really people are the most frustrated about. What is the language that people are using? And so yeah, he's how can parroting you get the most that back. To clap for you? Well, but he's parroting back what he already knows yeah. they want to hear, which is why they love but, it because he, then they, of course, you, feel like he yeah. understands me. But if in Virginia you say um, you lost support this year because uh, the Speaker of the House, William Howell, picked four appointees that nobody liked. I mean, they liked it before they voted for the largest tax increases in history, in the history of Virginia. But everybody's mad at them now. All the guys that were picked to do this were big government rhinos who know nothing about the Constitution. And they do the same thing. They just say no, or they send you some article. I've been fighting this since Alec was doing it, and before that I can't remember. I guess it was just a balanced budget. Um, and I thank God we have been doing it because I never thought it would gain any traction. I tried to get along with everybody because I thought, well, I sure don't want them messing with my constitution, but you used to just be able to say that. I I think the interesting thing for me right now, and I, I have this question for you guys is, So I was telling Jeff earlier today, I started my day, one of the policy issues I handle is is health care. So I started my day by uh, listening to uh, Oklahoma's Attorney General talk about their court case, their lawsuit against um, the exchanges and and Obamacare and Mike Carvin, um, who also was part of the big hall big um, court decision. And so knowing that one of the things Ferris really wants to do is to upend the Supreme Court and turn us into some sort of European court, because really what we need are, as Jeff said, more people <laughs> making decisions for us. But And, and there, then also more salaries to pay and more uh, retirement and, and more well, the thing uh, is, is that benefits. People felt, felt a really huge morale boost when the court decisions came out from the D.C. court, the Virginia court turned around and said, yay, nay, or I may have those backwards. Anyway, so there are a lot of things that are happening right now that don't make people really angry about SCOTUS in particular. And frankly, I think if the Republicans actually take the Senate, people aren't going to be nearly as PO'd um, as 
they are because most of us understand that most of the anger stems from partisan politics. You always want to blame the other guy. Um, yeah. So but, but I, now, I don't know how um, they're going to handle, how are they going to handle then the dynamics that will change, you know, cyclically through politics with, okay, so if, if this changes, if the Supreme Court actually takes up these lawsuits and totally upends um, the ACA, you know, one of the things that they're really able to tap into is the frustration and the feeling like um, nothing is happening. When that mm-hmm. changes, though, what do you think these guys are going to do? Because they'll, they'll have to change with it. And, and well, the, by then, the, the, left, time, the left will be advertising more than COS. That's, and that's what I want to get back to, because uh, the uh, uh, I know all of us could talk about this till the sun come up, and we have many more nights than I can remember. Uh, but uh, the the title of tonight's show is Article 5 Salesman in North Carolina. And we spent the last hour only talking about the conservative right that's promoting it. And for our North Carolina audience uh, specifically, so this is, uh, this is applicable to every state. The radical left is also involved in trying to trigger an Article 5 convention. With them, though, with them. This is one of the things that Ferris says in every presentation. If George Soros wants to hold his own attempt at triggering, that's up to him. What he isn't telling you is they are promoting their association, their coalition, their partnership with Wolfpack. And for Um, for those people who weren't... weren't, um, uh, Go read the In the Midst of Wolves article, because what you'll find out there, when I went to Indianapolis, other than some local uh, media that showed up just to get uh, that 15-second, you know, two-minute clip uh, for the local news that this event was going on, um, nobody was there capturing video uh, from the mainstream media at all. And the two people that captured the most video of what transpired in Indiana was myself and the executive director of Wolfpack, Ryan Clayton. We're we're coming up on an hour. I just want to let you know. I know. Hey, Jeff, let let me me get back to a real fundamental issue here because it's it's, it's really very simple. It is clear that these people are trying to get out one message and one message only. And my question to you is, is that a conservative principle? When have we conservatives ever uh, refused to debate an issue? That is a progressive Principle exactly. To, exactly. to to yell people and what, to yell and, people down. And, and let me and let me ask this though. Let's go a step further here, and it all comes right back to the same thing. And here comes Reverend Richard. Is it a Christian principle? Is it a Christian principle to accept only one side? Proverbs eighteen seventeen tells us that the person who tells one side of a story seems right until someone else comes and asks questions. And the Bible and the Judeo-Christian principles are clear. You get both sides of the story. You get both sides of the story. And if someone's trying to suppress something, something is wrong. And that's what's going on. It's going on in Kansas. That's what journalism used to be. It's going on in North Carolina. This is is an unholy alliance uh, to force upon the people lies and deceit. And it's got to stop. The goal is the goal is a constitutional convention. It's not a conservative package. I want to bring up the biggest lie, though. Um, Four hundred applications in the history of I thought it was more like seven hundred. And every time the state legislators start thinking about it, they rescind. But he says the reason that it has never happened 
It's not from rescinding. He never mentions that. He says it's because they don't agree on one subject. The, the, uh, the applications have to be similar. That is absolutely false. It doesn't matter what they apply for Convention 4. If there's, 50, if there's 34 applications, Congress shall call. He also says, and his, his leaders also say, uh, wrapped in his package of clear language, i.e., you know, he's going to define what commerce means, et cetera, and, you know, the supremacy clause, uh, that's what's going to make it all tie together and work. How is that not a constitutional convention? But every time he talks, it's not a constitutional convention. Well, but again, and again, this is Richard, again, they want to argue about those kinds of points because people, you know, people can argue about those. They're, they're, you know, you can have experts that say one thing and, and another expert or say another, and so you confuse people. But again, let's get back to the fundamentals. Why do they not want to have both sides of the story? Yeah. We can all, everybody can agree on that. That's the conservative Christian way of doing things. That is embedded in our republic itself. If you're yeah. accused of a crime, you have to get, you have the opportunity to give your side of the story, not just the other side is heard, and to bring in witnesses for your side of the story. It's called fundamental fairness that we honor and respect, or used to honor and respect in this country, and the same thing should be uh, adhered to as just a, as a matter of fundamental principles in us living our lives and in politics. And so you can argue whether or not there's a runaway convention or not. And you can argue whether you have to have an exact same application, which is bunk, but you can argue that, and people will not understand it. But people are fools if they do not understand when someone only wants one side of the story. And who has done that historically? The, the dictators, the communists, the socialists. There's only one story. And any other story is squelched or pounded down, and that's what they're yeah. doing now. And they're doing it at the with the help of some of our political uh, uh, servants who have an oath to uphold the Constitution and to serve us, not to serve Mike Ferris and these NGOs out there running around to serve us. And they're not doing it. And these people need to be called out on the carpet. Right, and I wanted uh, Carrie can't see this because she's not she's just on the phone and not uh, looking at the screen. But in, in North Carolina, Wolfpack has been very active. They also had an application introduced. And I, kept, I, I highlighted this part to uh, Mr. Ferris likes to refer to the operative clause, which is the actual request from the state, the clause that that, that calls on Congress. Or applies to Congress to call a convention. The Wolfpack application, their model application, is what I have highlighted on the screen. It doesn't mention a subject or an issue. They understand the left, the progressive left, understands the requirements of Article 5. And all it requires is for the states to apply for a convention for proposing amendments. It doesn't say you have to have a subject. It doesn't have say they have to be on the same subject. It doesn't say that once the convention is called that they can be limited to any subject or to one subject. It's simply not in the Constitution. But in North Carolina, the left via Wolfpack has also an int uh, introduced an Article 5 application in our General Assembly. They also have uh, lots of uh, there is engaged and involved in North Carolina trying to trigger an Article Five convention as the conservatives, such as Mr. Fair well, and the Lieutenant Governor. Jeff, again, let's go back to even more basic. The legal leader for an Article Five on the left for the progressives is Lyle Lessig who's a Harvard Law professor. And as you well know, in 2011, uh, Mark Meckler with the Patriot, uh, or Tea Party Patriots, right, a Koch brothers organization, co-hosted with Lessig 
the convention, uh, a conference on, the con uh, on a constitutional convention. That's before the marketing department decided to change it to a conference uh, or a convention of states. And it was a who's who of progressives. They were hosting it together, promoting it together, and Meckler continues. I've seen his face, I don't know how many times in different articles, meeting with progressive leaders uh, promoting this and 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 saying it's bipartisan. You hear that all the time. Oh, it's a bipartisan. It's bipartisan. I mean, let's not, let's and, not you know, let, let's cut to the chase here. They are, they are definitely in bed with each other. They can say all they want about uh, uh, Soros or whoever they want, you know, they want to talk about. The bottom line is they are in bed together and they've been in bed together for decades on this. They want. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got it on the screen, uh, and this is their actual conconcon.org. dot um, org. It is a conconcon, con. um, and look, there's there's good Democrats, there's good people on the left that are being told the same thing that the progressives will control this convention, and that just as the people on the right are being told that the conservatives will control this convention. And they both have empires that they are building to trigger this convention. And, they're, and, we made and the they argument, won't acknowledge that our rights will no longer come from God after the convention ends. Well, they're not, they're not unalienable. They're just fundamental. Even in, even but, in but, Michael Ferris's... But we won't uh, have, any, we won't have those. Condition. We won't have so those they're not anymore. rights anymore. They're privileges. Yeah. Well, the I want to mention. I want to mention something before. I want to mention something before I forget it. Um, if we mentioned Robbie George, Robert George, who's in the Jefferson Statement document. Have you all seen that? Yes. It well, was, I have. It was even on. It was even marketed on CBS. Uh, well, let, let me let me put that Robert in context. Robert George. Robert. Hold, hold that for a second. Hold that for a second. Let me let me get that document up and put it in context for him. Uh, tonight, okay. instead of answering a question, and we've seen him do this repeatedly in North Carolina and his staff councils do this in Virginia, uh, uh, trot out a list of, <laughs> of people that support what they're doing. And they put together a, a document called the, the, the Jefferson Statement. Statement. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that that that, and I've got it on the screen now. Anybody wants it, send me an email. I'll send it to you. Um, is that they, from the original or is that the revised one? This is the original. The original one says George. Robert George is is Council on Foreign yeah. Relations. The revised one does not. Okay. This is the revised one then. Well, I have the original. I handed you a copy of it at Virginia Beach. The original had him, had him as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which I don't know if he still is, but he was. And they've taken that off. Well, that's like being in the mafia. Once you're in there, you're in there for good. Pretty much. And I got to tell you, a woman stood up and said something that we don't often think about, and that is, what if the conservative delegates get into this convention and the chairman just ignores them, like at the Republican National Committee? And of course, Pierce says it's not going to be a Repub like the Republican Committee, and I felt like saying, no, it's going to have Democrats in it too, and they're going to shut them down too. But that was a perfectly valid question, and you know what his answer to her was? He said, listen. I have a little history lesson for you. I don't want you, you know, uh, you might not know this. So you might have been, you, you might, you might be from the, you might get your news from the common core. And I thought, if I was her, I would have smacked him. He didn't need to insult her. Yes, he certainly is a very arrogant and demeaning person. There's no doubt about it. But I, I think that your concern is, is not valid because, remember, 
that Mike Ferris is going to be the chairman. He's going to be the Washington of this convention. And we all know that Mike never uh, refuses to answer a question, right? He always gives everybody ample opportunity to ask, and he always answers the questions. So I'm sure and he we also, never... Know- and we also know that, that our uh, the most amazing leader ever, George Washington, had to make some compromises once he got in there. And he ain't no George Washington. He'll be like John Boehner. All right, as long if as you make the government bigger. If you live in North Carolina, just so you give you a heads up, um, I've got on the screen the Wolfpack North Carolina Legislator Contact uh, spreadsheet uh, that you can get at Wolfpack. Just go to North Carolina, click on the worksheet. Uh, Senator Don Davis has said, has confirmed to Wolfpack that he'll introduce their resolution in 2015. Senator Erling Parman has said she she will co-sponsor the Wolfpack Article 5 application in 2015. And if you scroll down this, uh, these are the, their interest level or color coded. These are all people who are supportive or very supportive or have acknowledged that they will sponsor or co-sponsor an Article 5 application on behalf of Wolfpack, which calls for essentially an open convention because their model application doesn't include a subject at all. Now, what Mr. Ferris and them will will tell you is what's in the whereas clauses is that it's about overturning Citizens United. And what they're telling legislators is that we're going to get the, the money out of politics. But the application itself, the legal document itself, is an open application. Mr. Ferris' yeah. staff counsel, Robert Kelly, acknowledged in a debate in Yorktown back in March that their application opens up the whole Constitution. But it's wrapped in clear language. Uh, but, yeah. But our, and our argument is, and this speaks to what Richard was talking about, you know, they're in, they've been in bed together on this from day one. And they've got a carrot, the dangle in front of everybody, from the left and the right, to help them trigger a convention. And this progressive socialist left application or organization that's promoting this, and the alleged, allegedly conservative Christian right organizations that are promoting this, their applications both open up the whole Constitution for amendments. Yep. And they both yep. have proposed amendments that are cra- from crazy town that will undermine the constitutional republic and the principles of liberty and the Judeo-Christian principles and federalism in this country forever. Do not take the carrot. Yep. If you go to this page and look, uh, we'll pack, look at North Carolina, if you're in North Carolina, um, and you will see, and I'm going to try and scroll through this a little. But if you look over here in the sidebar, you see how small that is? They've been very active in North Carolina. And I don't care what state you live in, they've got one of these worksheets where they've been targeting and reaching out uh, to your representatives and your senators in your state from the left, from Wolfpack, and the Convention of States Project is doing the same thing from the right, the Compact for America from the right, um, Citizens' Initiatives, with their crazy town uh, countermand amendment, which flips federalism on its head. And they're going to get together. In Indianapolis, they said, when they're in the Rules Committee, the very Rules Committee that North Carolina representatives Burt Jones and Chris Mill sat on, and I was there in person, had the video of it, discussed whether this, this, this rule this proposed delayed rule should be nonpartisan or bipartisan. They really wanted this to be a, you know, we didn't want to make this a partisan issue. And in the committee, the language was going to be nonpartisan. But when it came to the floor, before the full body of these state legislators, uh, they changed it back to bipartisan. 
<clears throat> and what happens when it's bipartisan? There's compromises. And the left will give up a little something, and the right will give up a little something, and we the people will lose something. Every time they get together, together, we lose. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. So we run uh, about 15 minutes longer than I planned on. Um, if uh, Richard or uh, or uh, Dawn have any uh, closing comments, if not, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll take any, uh, any questions anybody has. Uh, I will say join us next week, 9 o'clock, at join.me slash Patriot Coalition. And I'll have the archive up of tonight's show sometime tomorrow, if not if not before the end of the night. And the video um, from the Hendersonville and the Greensboro town halls with the lieutenant governor, I'll have those up in a few days. And I'll have something to say about them. 